We're having a think today about how to put together the results we've been looking at over the last week and a half. We've been looking at simple harmony motion, bless you, and we've also been thinking about mechanics and motion in more general terms. I want you to think back, very first lesson, right? When we're thinking about simple harmonic motion and the forces acting upon an object that is oscillating back and forth, right? What can you tell me? If we had a very simple differential equation that explained to us, that articulated what the forces were, what the acceleration was acting on an object moving in simple harmonic motion in terms of its Displacement, what was that? Yeah, go ahead, Anger. Minus n squared x. Fantastic. Minus n squared x if we're moving about x equals zero. And we could just like push on that just a little bit if we want to move somewhere else, around somewhere else um, instead of x equals zero. Instead of just x, we would say x minus c. Or plus, it doesn't really matter, right? But this just puts things in a positive frame for us, okay? So this is good, right? We've got this frame, but it only works for simple harmonic motion. Or specifically, it's, it's actually the way we know. If you have some kind of object and you know you can satisfy this equation, that's what tells you. That's like an indicator. Oh, it's simple harmonic motion. Then we went and sort of took one step aside and we said, you know what, regardless of whether something is simple harmonic or not, whether it's oscillating or not, we can actually state the force is acting on it, again, in terms of displacement. We had to use the chain rule. We actually had to use the chain rule a couple of times. We could state the forces, the acceleration, acting on something in terms of a derivative that was with respect to x. Can someone help me remember what was the weirder looking thing that fit up here? Half v squared. Thank you, Tarun, Right? Strange. I remember very distinctly learning this when I was in year 12 and being drastically confused by it. But the whole idea is very simple. I just want to think about forces, acceleration, in terms of displacement. And a couple of applications of chain rule, and you look back at that derivation we did um, a few days back, um, we'll get you to this. Now, clearly you can see the way I was leaning was to say, well, here's one way of looking at forces in a particular situation. Here's another. What happens when we put them together? So. On your next line, underneath this, right? We can say, combining these results, what are we going to be able to get? What will this help us to see? Well, if I just make a substitution here, right? And say, I've got this derivative of half v squared. And we know it's v's, but I'm picturing v as some function of x. That's why I can differentiate it with respect to x. In simple harmonic motion, it's going to be this, right? So I'm going to write my minus n squared x minus c, like so. Now what I want to try and do here is push on this relationship and see what I can learn from it, right? Now because you've got a derivative with respect to x on the left hand side and a function also in terms of x on the right hand side, what I can do is go from this to an integral. Every statement about a derivative is like a backward statement about integration, right? What I could do here is I could integrate both sides with respect to What's the variable? It's all x's, right? So I'm going to do that, right? Just before I do that, I'm going to do one step that may look a little strange, but it will make things easier for me in a second. See this half that's in the half v squared? Remember, it came from integration. That's where it's sort of, um, it's the integral of v. Uh, because it's just a constant coefficient, I'm going to pull it out. I'm going to take this half out. It can just sort of write it out here if I want. And in putting it out there, the reason it's there is so I can multiply through by 2 and get rid of that fraction. You'll see in a second why this is going to be a useful thing. What have I got here? If I multiply through by that 2, right? it's just a constant coefficient. So whether it's inside or outside the derivative, no big deal. It's going to be a multiplication by 2 on the right-hand side. But I'm going to write it in a bit of a weird spot. Follow along with me. I've got this minus n squared out the front. It's just a constant of some kind, depending on what n is. And the 2 that I've multiplied on both sides, I'm going to put it here. You might say, Mr. Weird, that's a weird spot to put it. I know, it is weird. It's partly because I know where I'm going on the next step and you don't potentially yet, though I gave you some clues. Morning, welcome. I said this statement about derivatives is like a statement about integration in disguise. So on this next line, I'm about to integrate. I'm about to integrate. Let's do the left-hand side because it's easy. When you integrate something like this, which is a derivative, what do you get back? Same. Just v squared, right? When you integrate the derivative, you return back to your original function. Great. Over here on the right-hand side, 
this is tricky, it's kind of a theme throughout the course, but particularly this topic, mechanics, you kind of have some algebra soup over here you need to see through, okay? Minus n squared, negative n squared, just a constant, right? So for the purposes of integration, I'm just going to kind of leave it there. Okay? Have a look at this. I could expand, I could, but do I need to? Like, think about this. I'm integrating up, right? This is, at the moment, a linear function. So when you integrate up in terms of x, c is just a constant. When you integrate up, you're going to get a quadratic, right? So this is really just like integrating 2x. You increase the power from a 1 to a 2. And so you then divide by that new power, which is 2. That's actually why I put the 2 there. Okay? So just watch closely. You get your constant hanging around there, constant coefficient, I should say. And then this integrates up into x minus c all squared. See why I did that? It's a bit of a weird step to, to do this directly, but hopefully you can see why I put that 2 there. I'm almost done. I integrated. Did I have boundaries? No. So this is an indefinite integral, which means there's a constant of integration flying around somewhere. Really, there's a constant of integration from both of these integrals, but constant of integration, another constant of integration, put together, it's just some other constant. Okay. Um, I normally call my constant c. That's a bad idea in this context because C is the center. I just need some other letter. Um, I'm going to call it K because that's another letter I commonly use for constants. And just over here, to make sure I know what I'm talking about, I'm just going to specify the K's some number. OK, now I'm going to pause here for a moment. OK, we've made some progress, right? What we have done is we've gone from understanding the forces, the acceleration, in terms of displacement. And now we've got something to do with the velocity in terms of displacement, that's progress. But then I've got this, I've introduced this problem. Because I integrated, no boundaries, of course I've got this. Now how are we going to evaluate this constant? We can, right? The way we're going to evaluate this is by thinking about what you know about the velocity of a particle that's moving under simple harmonic motion. If you have, I need another color. <clears throat> if you have an object, it's moving under simple harmonic motion. And as soon as I wrote this, you knew it was simple harmonic motion, right? What do you know about the particle's velocity that will help you to find out this constant, right? I need to do some stuff that's going to cancel things out, right? What do I know? Like, if you picture, I think I left my, um, no, I've got a spare, right? Here we go. <clears throat> if you picture back to that illustration I gave you of the rubber band, right? So you've got this oscillating object, and you know, it goes back and forth and back and forth. At what point in this object's motion, in my finger's motion, do you know useful things about the velocity of this object? What can you tell me? Can you take this? Brian, what are you thinking? At the maximum point, you have no velocity. At the maximum point, now, I think I know what you mean in terms of maximum point. You're like, when I'm furthest away from the center of motion. We have another sort of fancy word for that. starts with an E that we've used before. The extremities, right? At the extremes of motion, OK? Uh, I, we knew what you meant, right? OK. Um, at the extremes of motion, you stop. Because otherwise, it wouldn't be the extreme of motion. You stop there, and then you come back, and so on, right? So in other words, at some particular point that I can define, I know that under simple, and you should write this down by the way, under simple harmonic motion, we know when the velocity is zero. It's at these extremes, okay? Now, where are those extremes? In this sort of scheme, right? Well, you're going to go from some chosen center, and it's some distance in one direction, and then the same distance in the other direction. Do you agree? What do we call that distance, by the way? Starts with an A. That's the amplitude, because we're thinking trigonometric functions, right? So that amplitude is how far left and right we go, right? So the velocity is 0 when the x value is. You've got to measure from the center. So I'm going to put a c there for center. And you can go in either direction by that amplitude. So I guess I could say plus or minus a. Is that OK? This is where the velocity equals 0. If C is our center of motion if A is our amplitude. Can I pause for a moment and see what you can do with that? What I'm trying to do is use that information, uh, use those conditions, if you like, to try and find out what V, or rather what K, is equal to. That's the constant of integration I'm after. Can I pause for about 30, 45 seconds, see what you can come up with? We're looking for a value of K. See what you get.
I'm going to show you what's going to go on here, but I have a question for you. So have a think about this, okay? Here's me substituting in one of these values, one of these extremes of motion. I've chosen C plus A, but in a second, I'm going to ask you why it doesn't matter whether I choose C plus A or C minus A. You might think putting in totally different values for V equals zero might make something different, but in this case, as you'll see in a second, it won't. Here's me substituting it in, right? So you can see what's nice about this, though of course we would expect it because things should cancel out. Wherever your center of motion is, it will cancel, right? If your center of motion was x equals two, you're gonna get a two plus your amplitude minus two. So those things are gonna cancel out. That's not there. Uh, and my k is the thing that I'm after. So really all I need to do is add this entire term here, whatever it ends up being, to both sides. And you get your value of k, which is, by the way, n squared a squared which in a second we're going to put back into our expression for v squared and then we can tidy this, up, this thing up. Here's my question to you, right? I chose c plus a because I'm uh, discriminatory towards negative signs because they hurt my brain, but I could have just as easily chosen c minus a. Why is that? Because I square it, right? You see I'm squaring here, so even if this was c minus a, it'll be negative a squared. We should have expected that from the beginning because this is a symmetrical situation, isn't it? Right? The whole point is, whichever side you're on, you're acting in the opposite direction. So that's why you get this symmetrical situation. That's just what the algebra looks like. But visually, you can see it harks back to this situation. One extreme, other extreme, same thing is happening. What's our expression now for v squared? I'm going to substitute in this value of k, and then we can tidy up just a little bit. Uh, I've got this minus n squared x minus c squared that I got from integration, and now here comes n squared a squared. OK, any suggestions for how I can do a teeny bit of tiny up here? I'll factorize n squared. And while I'm at it, I'm also going to place this in a more sensible order for me. I'm going to place the I should have drawn a square bracket there. I'm going to place the positive term, the a squared, out the front. And then I've got this x minus c all squared on the other side. Are you happy with that? Does that look OK? All right, question for you. I want to go back to uh, one of the problems that we had a look at earlier in the week. On the, right hand, on the left hand side, uh, you've got v squared there. v squared has to be positive because we're in real number land at the moment, right? What would complex velocity looks like. Anyway, I'm not going to think about that too much. I've got this v squared over on the left, which has to be positive. Over here, I've got n squared, also has to be positive. And then I've got this thing. There's a subtraction here. I'm like slightly concerned. Can this ever be negative, this thing here in the brackets? Just on the basis of the algebra, it looks like it's totally possible, right? Something take away something can be negative sometimes, but I want you to think. This is not just some random situation. This is simple harmonic motion. So I want you to think all the way back to nature of proof, to some of the inequalities that we used and worked with there. Can anyone talk me through? How can we know, actually, this thing's never going to be negative? Doesn't always have to be positive, but it will definitely be non-negative, which I know is a distinction that caught us in one of our recent assessments. Not necessarily positive, but definitely non-negative. Can anyone give me any suggestions or clues? Yeah, again. The amplitude is inherently the maximum position. It's the max it can go. Mm -hmm. so if you subtract anything from it, it's always going to be non-negative. OK, all right. So if, you can't, if you're not quite following here, right? We're going to amplitude here squared. And this thing here it can't just be anything you like. The x has these kinds of boundaries, right? That's the domain of x. So if you have a think about this, I'm not going to use that color because it <coughs> wasn't very good. If you have a think about this, write this underneath with me, right? x can't just be anything. It has to be locked in between c minus a and c plus a. Yes? So therefore, relating this to the amplitude, if I subtract c from everything in this inequality, what do I get? I get negative a, x minus c, and then just a. See what I did there? Subtracted c from everything, it's just a constant, I can do that. How do I get from here to here to understand what's going on? I have this squared. Do you agree with that? When I square though, again, think back to your knowledge of inequalities. You've got to be really careful here because there's all these negatives going on, right? Once I square, I am going to get an a squared. What can you tell me about the direction of the inequality? This thing's smaller than this. So when you square it, 
its square should be smaller than the other square, right? Same deal over here, but this negative just ends up being another version of this, because negative a times negative a is still a squared. Following so far? So now, how do I get over to this? Well, looks like I'm going to subtract this from both sides. That leaves me with a 0 on the left, and an a squared minus x minus c all squared on the right. 0 is less than a thing, means that the thing is greater than or equal to 0. That's saying that this is non-negative. Do you see how I've reasoned that? So this thing here is greater than or equal to 0. Of course it can be equal to 0, because sometimes you're at the extremes of motion, you stop moving. So far, so good?